prologue on the dark train passing through. When all the lights went out, Peggy Lee Wynn was alone in the third car. She'd been trying to immerse herself in love's deadly stranger, trying to drive away thoughts of the bars of Lewis in a miserable night in on town, vainly fighting back tears. And the paper felt sat limp, forgotten in her hand. All she could think about was how frightened she had suddenly become. Oh, Christ, she moaned softly in the darkness. Slowly, she sat down the book and reached into the purse, groping for a moment. A finger closed around the lace and remained there, while her eyes cast, blinding from corner to corner. Her voice in her head welled. Too late to be talking, taking the subway alone. Her cheek bastard wouldn't even pay for a cab. God damn it. Peggy squeezed the mace for reassurance, tried to control herself. Light from the tunnel strode in through the windows. Playing against billboards for El Postco Coffee, Preparation H, and the others giggled, escaped her. It was buried under a roll of the train. Should I get up? She wanted to find some people, some light. She stood shaking in the centre of the aisle, looked in either direction, darkness. A sigh escaped her. She moved to the security of the metal holding post of her, her weight. A pretty girl, slightly overweight and mostly ten, trendy. What a slave of Manhattan's, you've got to look good, progressive. Wishing suddenly that she'd play down her curves. Who knew what kind of creeps rode at this time of night? The dark train pushed forward, racing towards the southern tip of Manhattan Island. It struck her that it would be rolling into the 42nd Street any minute now, and then through Times Square. Wasn't the greatest place in the world at 3.30 in the morning. It had to be better than this. There's a cop was anything, anyway. There'd be a cop or something, anyway. Yeah, there'd be light. There had to be hope. Hurry up, she almost prayed. Oh, hurry up, let me out of here. As if to answer, light flooded to the car. We the side quickly. She moved forward towards the centre door, watching the pillars whip apart. This regular hook popped a derelict and assembled. Long Times Square. 42nd Street sign, with pullers and officer, more pullers and more, pullers and more. She realised that the train wasn't going to stop. She pounded against the glass with her fist, a mute sob running in her throat, and the station went by. The last moment of concentrated light before darkness engulfed her. Once again, and completely, she saw the man standing in the square, face between the cars, staring through the door, staring at her, and she saw the door slowly open. He isn't stopping, Jerry, tapped out. To, to get out. Yeah, I see it, man. He answered, but Jerry wasn't watching that at all. His eyes were on a big black cop, rather coldly, where his mind worked. Yeah, officer. Do you got to find out that's wrong with old Bennett? Go out to look, what's that? Let, let, let's go out. Trains don't stop. Looks like the job of the police, don't you know? You know it. Cop found nervous and tall. On one hand, something is definitely wrong. On the other hand, skinhead punks of these guys formed their own category of bad news. Sure, one of them couldn't even sit up right. Now, might start puking in a minute. And one with his nose against glass looks too stupid to worry about it. But he'll be right there if his dirty creep starts saying anything. He knows he's unconsciously following a button of his gun. The dirty creep probably will. There were two other people in the car, too. Did all middle class hippie throwbacks probably never seen being surveyed as they got the lines they huddled together in the corner of the door. Eyes full of mute appeal. Jerry had been given um, grief before the lights went out. Yeah, raised voices had drawn off the vance from the last car where he'd really been trying to rouse the crashed out derelict. If I leave now, Vance knew for a fact that these boys are dead meat. Not that it makes much difference to me, but damn it, when I have to book Jerry, he grew to the friends, ch- chase him half a mile, tail and back to his friggin' blacked out train. Oh Jesus, full so sweet please. Darkness made him very, very nervous. He pretty well decided to stay with Peggy the Wind's scream ripped into the ears with from five scars ahead. 
two hippies jumped and fought for peace and came down, hugging each other like pansies in the high wind. Suddenly, his advanced chest tightened up and froze. That wasn't a natural scream. He quickly looked at Jerry's face and saw the fucker was smiling. Sick him, baby. Jerry yelled, Woof, woof, woof. It's a police dog. You done with, buddy boy, grow up. Seeing him out the window, Vance felt like kicking their heads together. Then packing the wind, screaming again. His time was worse, much worse. It walked, it walked, welled out and out, as though her soul were being soaked, gas me, it lit, so, said howling out of the mouth, shrivel and die midair. Even Jerry stood up for a second. Damn! Vance hissed. He had no choice. Peggy Linwin had made up his mind for him. Choking down fear, he drew his revolver and started running towards the front of the train. While Jerry refused to get out of the way, Vance knocked him on his arse and kept going just as the tunnel swallowed him up again. I hope it gets you, you black bastard, Jerry bellowed in the back, back darkness. Vance bit back a response by a nail, scared half out of his mind, screaming and stopped. But something was not, that was not reassuring. Somehow that was not reassuring. I hope it gets you too. The voice ran in his ears, like a scream, like the roar of the train. You black bastard. It hurt so be hated. But what a rattly, so completely on the basis. You have very little uniform pigment in the skin. The fact that he had to do that thing did nothing to dampen his rage. I love to blow you away, you white boy. That's for Gridley. As it came to the door, blow you right to hell. Off his will. But the girl, if well, that was what it was, might still be alive. He compelled to check out. The door stood open. He stepped into the space between cars. The wind blasted to him. His mental better foot from pitched and buckled beneath his feet. Carefully he reached over and opened the door. The next one moved from blackness to blackness to blackness causing nervously on the other side. A car was empty, silent, but for the ever-present thunder, no more than silent and empty, dead. Suddenly, Vance was overwhelmed by the feeling he's riding in a dead thing, already beginning to rot, kept in motion by a power of his, not of his own. Vance knocked on the conductor's door, no answer. He ran the door. Knock. Sit, he called. Are you in there? No answer. Something damp and chilling or cold in his cup. What the hell is going wrong with this train? He wondered, then forced itself to keep moving. A man named Donald Baldwin was stumped at the driver's seat, one hand droopfully at the foot of staring straight ahead. The lights from his instruments were the only working lights on the train. They cast red, white reds and yellows and shiny spots and streaks in the clothing. The door to the engineer's booth was locked from the inside. Any driver of the train kept it locked on night run because you were sick of that in there. The only lunatics rode at night anyway. If they were crazy enough to get here there in the first place you could be less you could at least minimize your risks. Tonight Don Baldwin been grateful for his half a brain. Right after leaving Fifty Third Street, Tommy started to rattle the door. But not just the train shaking down. Something was trying to get in. Don didn't know why he thought something instead of someone, but he did. He scared the bejeebus of him. Having. He tried to raise Sid, conductor, who sat in a similar cab towards the middle of the train. No answer. He couldn't even be sure if the intercom was working. Goddamn train is falling apart. He suddenly grasped more whole damn goddamn transit system. He followed a sudden vivid flash of Sid and Vance. Just saying how it was that kind of laziness, spear chucking. Bastards that were dragging and the stored ways to ruin. And me with a nutcase at the door, he moaned, God damn it. Don lit a cigarette. He's 23rd of night. He always smoked a lot. Runs. Killed time. What else could you do? Could you, what else could you do? Even his side the window open. He filled up with smoking pretty, but pretty fast in there. He never saw the mist drift under the door. He never even really knew what he did. By the time Officer Vance reached the car, the Peggy Lewin lived and died. The back of the train was suddenly filling up with rats. 
They were grey, squat, slightly like a bastard, with red gleaming eyes, came up from the floor like maggots out. Poor bulk. As though they'd been there the whole time, just waiting. They only had fence, fell to rounds, but still see anything. Decked out in the cool, curved plastic of the seats, taking their own smells. The rats had found him, just as Vance had found him by the, by the dark shape in the doorway. Satan had moved towards the dark lead thing at his feet and impelled him with his, its luminous eyes. Cigarette, Jerry said, was kneeling in front of two wings, wimps, grinning unpleasantly. They look. They shook their heads, blubbering. He smacked the taller one across the face, eliciting a yelp. I don't ask. I didn't ask if you wanted one. I asked if you got if you got one. To a wimp, 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 dearie. I mean, he shook his head one more effectively and whimpered a little. First time he ever wished for cigarettes, too. Big night for the first. Fortunately, his friend Robert had one. A little hell on head pulled of thing. Terry got knocked out of his, his shaky fingers and handed it to Terry. What the hell is this, Terry? Took it in his bed and a light from the tunnel. Tunnels? Are these any good? I like them, Robert said, reaching a reach kind of showy grin. He's no nooks, teacher, with classes back in our base. Do you remember a movie you saw on TV once with Tom Muskie, Mike Sheen, playing badass, teen psychos, who terrorized 16 people on a subway train? He's called the Eastman, and he made him swear he'll never be intimidated like that. He, he was. He, he had even simpler and sc- simmer and scrum scrum let some some tough way get take him apart piece by piece. He even had fooled himself apart about that for such a long time. No more. If Jerry wanted to take Jerry Robert apart, Jerry could go right ahead. Robert wasn't I wasn't going to do shit. Robert was going to risk a chummy grin. Wait, Jerry she said, grinning back. You got everything else? Anything else? I might like baby boy. Well, it smiled dried up. He reached in his pocket. You too, doll, said Jerry, stupid fiend. Going over to join in the fun. William Deer nodded. Well, it's fuzzing his neck far more than it's mine. He echoed his friend Chester, coming up with eighty dollars in the crisp twenties. What damn movies? You done good by us. They punch William on his shoulder and affection. Yeah, buddy, don't go so hot. Well, what's the matter? Little Jesus? No, you're giving it at church. He grabbed Robert by the collar and started to hoist him out of the seat. Then the door in the front of the door, front of the car slammed open and bounced. We appeared still holding the gun. There's something that was stiff about his movement. As he came towards them, his eyes were red like rats. They had hit the street for the street. Yes, the first shot went off. As, as just the first shot went off. Striking Jerry's arsehole friend in the forehead and spinning him backward, light flooded the room, drain, removing the brains and blood that splattered in the back wall. Jerry jumped back, freaking. William and Robert squealed like pigs. Jerry remaining. Friend, the drunk and sickly one, looked up in time to see a nightmare appear in a door behind Vance. He groaned so soon, as soon he was delirious and lost it, it all over the floor. Vance pumped two bullets into him, rolling him off into his own vomit. Face first and forever still. Jesus! Jerry screamed. He pulled out a very nasty blade from his back pocket and flipped it open, put it out to rest against William Deer's throat. The gangly hippie came up with ease, back pressed against Jerry's pounding chest. One more step, man. This boy gets his throat slit. Vance's next shot smashed William Deer's nose on its way out on the other side. The body jerked at once and then sagged in Jerry's arms. He pushed it away with a tiny animal sound and ran screaming towards the cop.